Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. This is the podcast where I have a conversation with guests from the architectural community and beyond to talk about the co-evolution of architecture and technology. A quick reminder that you can get the show notes from each episode sent directly to your inbox. Sign up at trxl.co. Just click on one of the subscribe buttons in the corner of the site. You can't miss them. In this episode, I welcome back Robert Ewan to the podcast. Robert is the CEO and co-founder of Monograph, a software company revolutionizing the future of architecture and engineering firm performance. Trained in architecture, he recognized the need for better business tools and developed Monograph to address the challenges facing AE professionals. As a result, he has become a leading voice in the industry, promoting the importance of AE business performance and helping firms improve their workflows and profitability. His mission is to always be in service to the design professionals responsible for our built environment, letting them focus on what they love and do best. Near the end of the conversation that you're about to hear, I tell Robert that listening to him talk is like attending a sermon. And I was thinking at the time was that, I mean, his wisdom is something we need to hear, but not necessarily something we always want to hear. But alas, it escaped me in the moment. Anyway, I hope that that point comes across and makes sense when you hear it. Luckily for me, this is the beauty of recording these introductions after the conversation. In this episode, we discuss inflation, interest rates, economic uncertainty, oh my, how these affect your architecture and engineering practices, Monograph's AE Strategic Risk Report for 2023, how to get ahead of the likely upcoming challenges in regards to business foundations, culture, and talent retention, recalibrating business, the true value of relationships with staff and clients in practice, technology adoption strategies, what's next for Monograph, and more. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Robert Ewan. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you back. Thanks for having me back. I think it's been almost a year exactly since you were on the show. I mean, we talked in Austin. I remember that conversation in Austin. That should have been recorded. That's the point of this podcast is to record stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible. Yeah. It was amazing to see you in person. Are you going to be in San Francisco in June? I assume the answer is yes, since you are in San Francisco all the time. It is my backyard. I will right. be here. Are right. you coming? I am. Yep. I'll be there once again. So looking forward to that for sure. Uh, I hope you're carrying a mic. I believe there's going to be a lot of amazing conversations in person. I can't wait. Yeah, we'll have a booth there. So I'll be recording conversations in the booth for the Peopleverse podcast, which listeners of the show may or may not know about. But that's another one that's really specific to architecture, design professionals, and product manufacturing side of things, which is what we're doing at Tech. So there's going to be a lot of recording happening in San Francisco, for sure. It's going to come really quick. Can't wait. It is. A lot's happened in a year, Robert, right? I think the last time we were talking on this show, it was really, and I'll put a link to that conversation in the show notes, but the conversation then, we were really talking about leadership and knowledge transfer and things like that. And now the topics have shifted, right? I think the writing has been on the wall for a little bit, but you guys just recently released a report. And by you guys, I mean Monograph, the team at Monograph has released this report. So we won't get into your backstory. We won't get in because that's been done, which is the great thing about having guests return on this show is now we can jump into kind of the nitty gritty topics, but you have been doing a lot of work. Monograph is focused on business and practice operations, building killer businesses. And I mean that in a good way. And so maybe you can give us the low down jumping off point of where this report, what this has started to illuminate and what you're sharing with the industry. Oh, man. So a lot has happened. Monograph is in a position where we're really privileged, where we see all of these trends already ahead and it gave us a really unique opportunity when we started this year to create that report and really share some of the insights that we're seeing across the industry. Where are all the major risks so the broader industry and the broader practice can understand? We felt extraordinarily responsible to make sure that that information gets out to a larger mm-hmm. audience. Yeah. Well, and you said one of your core values is to do the hard work and I'm not sure that's going to make it into the edit or not, but I want to repeat it because like you just said, you have the privilege of, and I think A lot of the guests on this show are operating at a level that is more industry-wide than practice-specific, and that is something that I try to tap into and bring to the surface of a lot of these conversations, which is like, what are you seeing across all these firms that you can share? What are the things that we can stop struggling with individually and independently of one another? 
and start using this information in a much more smart way. We don't have to be in our own silos all the time with everything. There are definitely specific, maybe practice-related things, but the stuff that you're talking about here, just to reinforce this idea that you felt like you had to share it. I love that attitude, and I think it's hopefully well-received in the industry as well with that same attitude. That's just a, a beautiful thing that you guys are doing. Well, it's inherently baked into the Monograph's DNA. We have an accountability we have a responsibility. And every week I repeat back to the entire company, our, our mission is always to be in service to architects, to be in service. And we can take that form in many different ways. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that we're pushing really hard to make sure that the industry knows is just understanding the current economic environment that everyone's in right now. One of the first things that we've identified is that there's just a lot of economic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. We don't know where the price of eggs are going to stop increasing. <laughs> right. Uh, we don't know how high gas prices are going to go. And these are all essentially inflationary type of trends. If you don't understand what that means, like the easiest thing you think about is prices for everything is going up. Everything. 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 I just read this morning on LinkedIn that Amazon is going to stop allowing free returns at the UPS stores, depending on proximity to other Things like if you live near a Whole Foods, then they might charge you to return something at the UPS store. How much would they charge you? Uh, maybe a dollar. And just a small example of what we're seeing across the board. We're seeing that exact same thing everywhere. It's a dollar here. It's a two dollars there. It's ten dollars here. This new feature is going to cost you an extra ten bucks a month in the software. And you see all of this happening. And it's like we kind of don't even want to know, <laughs> right? I think that's what catches people by surprise when all of a sudden you are paying double across the board for everything. And it's like, how did that happen? Well, it snuck up on you. It happened slowly and then suddenly, mm -hmm. right? Those are the kinds of things that you're talking about. And so compound that across a workforce or a practice with all of the people that you have to feed, with all of the number of yeah. projects that you have to have in the pipeline to keep those people. I saw in your report and recognized as kind of an oh crap moment. There's been a lot of growth in the last couple of years, right? Mm. Everybody's right. saying we have so many projects, we can't get enough people. And then when things slow down quickly and you've built the machine to sustain that level of growth or at least that amount of throughput, what do you do when things slow down quickly? Our profession has been well known as one to lay off people in droves very quickly and very suddenly. And I think now the culture that emerging professionals, young professionals expect is for these companies to really like dig in and say, how are we going to help sustain our workforce? And how are we going to keep them here? How are we going to retain the talent? And so all of these things are playing in and it's got to be really tough for a lot of people. And I think it will be like, we see the trend going that way. Mm. The good thing is, I think there's still a lot of time. The whole point of getting the report out now is like, there's still yeah. time to put in really good practices. There's still time to acknowledge this is coming. So we don't repeat in 08, 09. I think there's a lot of things that an entire industry can do to hedge that from happening. It starts with acknowledgement. So it's not a surprise. And you put in practices and best practices now. So you don't run into a scenario where it feels like a surprise because it's coming. Yeah, interesting. So you guys share some hints and strategies in the report on how mm -hmm. firms out there are doing that, right? What they're doing to get ahead of this, what they're doing to be proactive about all that. In the report, we've generally categorized strategies and tactics into like four themes. And we've labeled them as strategies to counter four different types of risk. One is like a client risk, a money risk, a staff risk, and a time risk. And these are the four major, let's say, sectors every practice, every firm owner, every architect should be considering what is their level of risk within those four categories and what is the right tactic and strategies that they need to implement to hedge what's coming in the future. Mm. Can you give us some ideas about what those common themes that you've collected from these different firms out there are? Because one of the things that's always, I'm trying to figure out the right way to say this, I've seen other reports where it's like, here's the problems and there's no offer of solutions. And this is coming from, again, industry-wide perspective. And it's like, well, okay, so everybody's left to themselves to figure out how to address this. Or some of the recommend, if there are recommendations, I've also seen it this way, there are very heavy lift for everybody mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. 
then it just becomes like, I already don't have time to do the things that I need to do <laughs> in my business. How am I going to retool everything under the hood right now when I have to do all of these other priorities? Can you give us some of those, just tease us with what some of those things are? Because I, I want people to read the report, but I want them to read the report or at least get into it knowing that there's going to be some solid advice in there. Yeah, I do want to share, please read the report. And we worked extraordinarily hard to make sure we didn't stay too broad, which means it's kind of not very useful other than saying, oh my God. And we tried to also propose strategies and tactics that are like, if we don't believe we can pull it off in a reasonable amount of time, it's not useful either. So the tactics and strategies have to align within a time box. It has to be executable. An example of this in one of our themes, which is client risk, as inflation goes up, think like a client. Angela Brooks at Brooks Scarpa Architects gave an amazing advice in terms of think like a client. And I think just thinking that way puts into a lot of different perspectives. One, they're paying for the project. We are professional service provider. They're paying for a service when inflation is going up. How much exposure do they have to the public markets? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. It'll give you a lot of insights into like how the financial stability of your clients are and where are they exposed? I don't know, gosh, like did you hear the news a couple of weeks ago with SVB and First mm -hmm. Republic? Right. I think reestablishing your relationships with your current clients can give you a lot of information in terms of what the future might look like. And future meaning like the next three to six months. I'm just trying to get an idea of what their exposure is like to kind of like hedge against possible projects going on pause. And a simple thing to do is pick up the phone, call your client. <laughs> and this is not to ask for an invoice, right? This is also not to ask for the next design meeting. You pick up the phone and call them and just, you just want to know how they are. Treat it like a relationship. Hannah Brown gave another amazing advice in terms of just getting back to basics, business development in person. I think a lot of us got really comfortable during COVID, but it's, there's no replacing an in-person relationship. And during tough times, this is where everyone needs to lean on your closest relationships the most. And that's a broad statement. Like that's yeah. at home, that's at work with your partners, at work with your staff and employees, and also with your clients. They mm. are part of your business. That whole idea of, and this has been a thread that's been running amongst episodes, and maybe that's because of what I've been thinking about a lot recently, which is the value of relationships and the wisdom that's in the people behind the tech, behind the projects, behind the mm -hmm. practices, and leveraging that by establishing relationships. That information, that wisdom, that experience is there. And if you want to be a trusted advisor, if you want to be perceived as that, like you actually, like you said, you have to do the hard work. You can't just wait for people to come to you to ask you those questions. You have to get in front of that and go have those proactive conversations and share that information and this is like, this is the evolutionary story of the human race, right? It's like the survival of the fittest is maybe the simplest way to say that, right? It's the yeah. proactive going out and spreading this is so, so important to survival from so many aspects. And so I'm glad to hear you say that because I guess that reinforces... I'm, Happy to hear this confirmation bias. But at the same time, there's a technology story here. And so when you talk about coming out of COVID, I think what we have experienced is separation is one way to say it. We go looking for things online rather than calling a person, picking up the phone and asking people. And so I think that that has started to boil the frog in a very different way, which is it's gotten us much more used to just doing these things on our own, looking things up. We don't know even if the source of the quote unquote truth is trustworthy or not, because there's so many different places we get our information from now. And so this idea of kind of doubling down and going back to relationships, it just seems like we need to achieve a balance there, right? The technology is yeah. not going anywhere. It's not going away. And so we have to figure out the best uses of the pieces of the recipe that we already have and the new things that are coming out. These ideas that you're talking about in the report and the examples that you just shared, thinking like a client, like what are our clients? biggest fears? How can we just pick up the phone and have a conversation with them to help them maybe not be so fearful about something or to say, we're here to help. Yeah, We're here to help you navigate through that. Those kinds of offerings really do establish a trust over time that then becomes the backbone of your business. Back in my early days, there's the rainmakers in the office and what do they have? They have a deep Rolodex of relationships with people. Yes. And that has gotten thinner and thinner and thinner over time, just like the architect 
architectural magazines. Those things have gotten thinner and thinner and thinner over time. And that I think what you're addressing right now is like, it's time to get ahead of that and get out there and address those. Yeah, I don't know if it got thinner. I think there's just been less of a spotlight. Evan, at the end of the day, the industry as a whole, we provide a service. We're professionals. There's always a relationship layer. It's never going to go away. So I think it's always been there, but there hasn't been a really strong spotlight on it. And there's been a really big spotlight on just the technology. Yeah. And I'm also not saying like drop the technology. I don't see this as like going forward and going backwards. The relationship has always been there. It's mm-hmm. a foundation for every business. Don't lose sight of it. I think it's just put the spotlight back there in times when we need to. They never went away. We've just might have not put in the due diligence enough over the last two years. And it's time to refocus there. But the tech's not going away. You don't have to get on a phone call. You could use Zoom. You could use Microsoft Teams. You could use Slack. Uh, There's a number of ways now to stay in touch today more than ever. So there, yeah. there's a number of ways to do it. The only biggest advice is like, do that. Get back in touch. Yeah, one of the tips that I've received over the years, and I think this was from Derek Sivers, who talked about, he's a prolific author and musician. And he had this advice of having your own database. It's your contacts, right? Your contact mm-hmm. database of people and actually write down in there the way in which they like to communicate. So is it phone? Is it text? Is it Teams? Is it Slack? Like, what is it? And What can you do to make it easy to have that conversation with them? Because you could send an email and guess what? I get 150 emails a day. It's like, it's not going to get addressed, right? I know somebody who is just on the show who's like, can you please just text me anytime you want to talk? Because that's, that's where I see it, right? That I think is just a little tip, throw it out there. Like just note down how people like to communicate and then use that. It's an amazing tip. Similar to the tip that Mark LePage gave us, which is just track, track your clients interactions because everyone's communication style is slightly different. Mm -hmm. preferred communication channel is different so set those expectations and know them i'm the same like if you email me it's going to take it's going to take a week before i can respond to you like i get somewhere close to like 150 to 300 emails a day if it's urgent send me a text message and what's your phone number robert you have it i'm not i'm not going to share it on the podcast uh that that will make my phone number useless then right Uh, (laughs) No, no worries so what other kinds of things are in this report i think one of the stories that was really interesting was what was shared out of Marlon Blackwell Associates office regarding how, I guess, just the kind of the struggle of, and maybe we move into more of like, what are the threats that are against practice right now or that are coming in the near future? One of the ones that was cited was that regionality is becoming less and less of a thing. Being able to rely on clients and projects showing up in your region and you getting them because architects are extending their practices out and trying to go beyond their typical footprint because they have to. What do you do in response to that? You kind of have to do the same thing. You've also got to get out farther and farther from your home base if you really are a regional practice. I thought that was interesting because it's worth bringing up what these various kind of threats are. And then it's interesting to see how people are starting to deal with those. So I think in this particular, it's a great way to reevaluate the role of technology and how it can extend businesses like business development reach or marketing reach. They're absolutely correct. I think in times like this, every firm needs to start thinking beyond their hyper-localized work and see where there are opportunities to, in a new way, leverage technology a little bit more to extend that reach. But there's also manual things you can do. You can get on a plane. You can get on a plane and meet people in person in a different state. Talk about inflation, man. Plane flight prices are crazy, but another thing to deal with. It is another thing to deal with and another thing for every firm to assess. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think every firm is in the position where they're able to get on a plane all the time. Right. Um, I don't think every firm is ready to take on work that's beyond their 10, 20, 100 mile radius. But I think every firm should start thinking strategically and like, well, what, where are they headed and what do they need to do? And are there technology tools that help people identify where that is? Or do you think it's something else? I know there are companies out there who have built tools to identify ideal places to do the thing that they're doing. One of a previous example of a guest on the show, Sam from Homestead, Mm -hmm. they had developed an algorithm to identify particular lots and particular subdivisions where it looked like, and this is kind of an extreme example, but it looked like the yard wasn't being taken care of. And then they were able to look at those and say, okay, for California's bill SB9, we can do a lot split here. Clearly they're not utilizing 
the land. And I thought that was just a really interesting approach. Yep. There are ways in which you can use data to identify where those things are. And then there's just getting your feet on the ground and going out and do it. And word of mouth and relationships and things like that. And it's probably a little bit of everything, right? But you have to be proactive about it again. You can't just be waiting for people to call you. You have to be looking for ways to get out there and, and getting ahead of it. That's a really, really good point because I think the more the more you wait and the less proactive you are, the more likely a surprise will hit you. The whole point of this is I don't want a surprise. Surprises yeah. are not good. Uh, like, <laughs> they're not good. Right. <laughs> uh, like if something bad's coming, I want to know. I want to see it coming. I want to do everything I can to to avoid the bad thing. Surprises are bad. And the only way to essentially solve for no surprises is to be proactive. I think there's a lot of ways architects can continue to look for, let's say, interesting opportunities to find indicators of where there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I think going back to being really like obvious and really easy to implement, first is just to acknowledge where is most of your project come from historically. Yeah. Just look within. I have a feeling that most of the industry still to this day their work is repeat work. Mm -hmm. We can do a, a happy hour tour, Evan, and I think we will get nine out of 10 architects say most of the work is repeat work. All that tells me is your client relationships are really important. Yeah, right. Focus there because that's the future work, which is repeat work. Ensure that it's healthy. Mm -hmm. Goes back to that idea of relationships. Yes, right? Like if that's not healthy, then you kind of know what to do just to build new relationships to offset where there might be instability in the current forecast of future work with your current clients because it's a repeat work business model. This Don't immediately jump to something new yet when you haven't first reassess, mm -hmm. you know, your current situation. Yeah, this makes me think of a couple things. One of which is the value of that relationship is so much higher than what it costs, the actual cost of finding new clients. Therefore, it, it comes back to what the experience of that service was for them previously. Yeah. Because the threat is, is that other firms are, if you're regional, they're coming in to your market and threatening the chance that you will get the next project, even from a client that you've had before. And that's where then the relationship, the quality of that relationship starts to really matter, right? Because did they have a good experience throughout that project? We know these projects take a long time. We know that it's stressful. There's a lot of strain on the relationship during those projects, I'm sure, for a lot of clients and for a lot of professionals. And so how are you able to manage those expectations and that experience? throughout the lifetime of that project so that when the next one comes along, you're the easy choice. And what can you do to make it easy for them to choose you? Because one of the things, again, getting back to the MBA example, the Marlon Blackwell Associates, they're saying, because of this threat, we have to lower our fees. And it's like, what is the value of an architect? How do we come together as an industry mm -hmm. to talk about the value of an architect? And they pointed out some contrast to construction with change orders. Change orders are expected when things don't work out right in construction. But yet when an architect has to redesign something, the example was cited was like, often we have to do it over for free, right? Part of it. So, I mean, maybe you can speak to some of that, just kind of riffing off of what we're talking about here. Yeah, we, we, we're moving on from client risk to money risk. I think right. in, in a scenario where everything costs more, this is the worst time to reduce your fees. Yeah. Generally speaking, everyone's fees are already behind what they need right. to be. This is absolute worst time to drop it more because the you know the value of that dollar is continuing to drop like you if anything everyone needs to reevaluate and increase fees you have to we go back to when we started this like the cost to buy eggs and the cost to fill up gas just went up for you it's the worst time to lower your fees it doesn't yeah. doesn't make any sense it's a dilution of so many things Obviously, Monograph is a tool to track this kind of thing in an office and in a practice. Mm. What can you share about the value of having a system that you can rely on when it comes? I mean, a lot of times technology is seen as an answer to a problem, especially with a tool like yours and so many that we are seeing coming mm. in and kind of disrupting the industry. Garbage in, garbage out. And I think that's something that so many firms are struggling with is, is either the lack of ability to get unique insights from their data because the data is crap. And this, to me, is probably the worst place to have crap data is tracking the business side, the time, the effort, the dollars spent. 
yep. on these projects because if you can't rely on it, it's impossible to forecast how long that next project's going to take, what the effort's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. You've nailed it. And I think that broader industry has has at least two problems. One, you don't track at all. Right. So like you don't even have a garbage in, garbage out problem. You have nothing. It's called intuitive tracking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah, nothing nothing but gut and that's really bad you don't really know and all you have are touchy feely feelings mm -hmm. and you're running on intuition extraordinarily hard to make unbiased decisions and extraordinarily hard to do any type of forecasting because mm -hmm. um, you don't you don't have a starting point forecasting you can only do forecasting if you have a starting point yeah the second problem is exactly what you've already mentioned is if your data and you do have data but it's just like not good data and the industry is lagged with bad data personal experience when i was working at at a much bigger organization i used to lie on my hours all the time yes oh yeah that's rampant right like because they don't want me writing down 80 hour weeks they don't they want, right. they want me to write 40 right but in reality it took me 80 hours of time to accomplish the work right then what happens and this was the younger version of me is like i'm feeding into a system where it doesn't actually help me one month later the principals the studio directors like robert you can pull this off We've you, laid out forecast. You just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, that's where it hit me. Yeah. I just shot myself in the foot. Right. I shot myself in the foot because they're using that data to make future plans on how they look at staffing and resourcing. And everyone thinks that the firm is actually profitable on a utilization rate, but they're not because probably everyone is doing two times the amount of hours. So like their effective billable rate is actually half. And why is our staff leaving? Right. Like why are people going to other places where it's probably the same? Right. Just whisper that. Because there's massive burnout and it's a yeah, two way street. Right. The staff doesn't know exactly, let's say, the value of tracking time correctly. Well, because they're taught otherwise. They're taught to. Or not taught at all. Yeah, or not taught. And there's just an expectation of. I mean, and this happens, it starts in school. It's like, do whatever it yeah. takes. And how long does the project take? It takes as long as it takes. These are things that are programmed into architects as yeah. they graduate from before graduation it's so frustrating for me to see that sometimes because i know architects work with constraints really well that's the whole point of design is that there's always constraints that's right. why we talk about context there's a site there's a constraint there's an far there's an area constraints there are setback constraints architects are really really good at working with constraints but we remove all those constraints when we think about the business and that doesn't help and is that because we're not trained in business quote unquote i mean we see that a lot we <laughs> <laughs> graduates uh, who come out of school, there's one pro practice course. There's no training on business. We're not saying anything new here. Yeah. Because there is a lack of emphasis or even a lack of anything in many architectural education programs out there regarding business, how to run a profitable business. And there is so much on the other end of that, which is like suffer for your art and do whatever it takes to get architecture, mm -hmm. capital A architecture built that like that is like the perfect storm for what you're talking about. So I see massive changes coming because we do have to address this head on. Monograph is extraordinarily honored and privileged to continue to work on this mission to be that business backbone to the industry. But we also need every architect to also acknowledge that we need to do things that are business minded because it is a business like we're trying to yeah. put food on the table. If you're a firm owner, you're, you're also responsible for the well-being of your team. You're responsible for payroll. There is absolutely a business aspect to architecture. Is it 100%? Absolutely not. There's a creative process as well. But when you over-index on one and not acknowledge the other, it leads to an unhealthy relationship. All we want is, we don't want surprises. We want healthy relationships, client and money, which means we got to work on it. On the money side, there's easy things we can, we can do. Like I think one of the things is just knowing where the money is tracking mm -hmm. your data if you don't the number one rule you gotta track it first we can deal with garbage in and garbage out later as long as you have some set of data if you already have the data then it is really like being honest with yourself it might not be in the data you have to talk to your team does this really take you 40 hours you'll get the answer it took me 60 65 if you have a relationship yeah i think you have to put an asterisk on that because architects do want to please especially young architects they want to please their supervisors and they kind of want to tell them what they want to hear here. I think that happens all the time. I know it all happens all the time. This idea, again, of kind of going back to this idea of the relationship so that you can have real conversations about that is so important. The other side of that coin is like there are people out there who will tell you exactly what it is and they won't sugarcoat it at all. I think those are 
probably the few rather than the many. There are people like that. I can think of people in my past who were just mm. like, no, this is the way it is right here. Like just straight up. They're not trying to sugarcoat. And then there are the others who are like, you know, I can do an all nighter and I can not write down the number of hours that it took. And that's fine because this is what I'm trained to do. And this is how I do it. Yes and no. Statistically proven, most of the industry is small, like 80, 90 percent of the entire industry is small. And when you're in a small business, you see everything. Yeah. It's a very different problem if you're a larger business. Right? If we're talking about like a, an SOM or a Gensler or an HOK, then it becomes a lot harder. But 80, 90 percent of the entire industry is like firm sizes that are like 5, 10, 15 people. That's a good point. Yep. All I'm asking here is if you're the firm owner to do some introspective and be honest with yourself, you saw that all nighter happen. It's 10 people, five people. Like you saw right. it happen. Yep. And then you look at the timesheet and it says 40. I was like, it's not right. Time for a conversation, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not avoidance. So with a tool like Monograph and this idea of getting good information so that you can make better decisions in the future. Do you guys, and this doesn't pertain just to Monograph, I think this pertains to anything, but what is a good strategy to begin? There's so much historical data that cannot be relied on that it takes mm. way too much effort to go back and shift it and to modify it and to make it real. The strategy when I was leading digital practice was, you no, know, you start on the next project. I mean, these projects take a long time mm -hmm. and you have to start somewhere. And so where do you start implementing the new standards or the new libraries? Because you're not going to be able to go back and swap all this stuff out. That's a daunting task. Yep. And if you outsource it to somebody else, it's not going to have the insights that you had being on the project, right? You need the person who did it to do that kind of thing. So to me, the clear and obvious strategy is to start with a new project and start with that clean slate and mm. start to build the resource that you can rely on. Does that match up with what you recommend? It does not. And I'll tell you why it does not. Tell me the right way to do it. And the only reason why I say it does not is, well, projects, most firms have more than one project. Most firms, those projects are not starting and ending at the same time. True. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and in larger firms, people are swapping teams. Yeah. The same team doesn't move on to the next project. It's complicated, right? Yes. So what is the what do you do? And remember, we're trying to solve a business problem, not a project problem. When you're starting fresh on a single project and that might not align with another project and you're a firm owner trying to look at the entire business, oh my God, how are you going to understand the trend? They're all going to roll up. Yeah, no, this is like down the road, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... That's the only reason why yeah. I don't align with that strategy. I think, so this is first principle thinking. What are you trying to solve? Well, we're trying to have better visibility for the business, not just a single project one at a time. And keep that top of mind as you work through how to troubleshoot problems that are existing. In this case, when do you start collecting more accurate data for the business? The right approach is actually to start it all at the same time. You peg it to a calendar date not to a project start and end date. I'm nodding my head in agreement along with you because I feel like that is totally ideal. Yeah. But shifting gears midstream, how do you actually do that? Do you have six? I mean, I would hope you would have success stories of that kind of, because what we're talking about is adoption, right? Yeah. And adoption of a new behavior is hard, <laughs> let alone a new tool and the learning curve that may or may not come along with that. So you're saying this is a top-down decision for the business that has to mm -hmm. be made. And I think we do have to acknowledge the gap between the ideal and the reality of how hard it is to do that on projects. So what do you tell people? I say peg it to a calendar date. And I say peg it to, I'm making some assumptions here for everyone. If you are billing and invoicing every project monthly, well, there's your opportunity. You close out the books and you're starting the books on a new month. Mm. That's also where you start. You can then recalibrate all your projects because now you know your total budget remaining across all projects. And then you reestablish new systems moving forward. Now, if your billing cycles are like not monthly, this complicates things a little bit. There's a suggestion also in the report by Bellani of like really understanding the collection periods that your business operates and question are those all those collection periods sustainable here at monograph the tighter you are if you are historically phase-based billing the goal is to see if we can get into monthly billing what that does for a business is it gives you predictable cash flow 
this is like what software has done, right? It's gone from buy once up front to subscription so that yeah. the but idea of sustainability of a business is kind of based on this idea of recurring revenue. If people don't understand the value of that, what might be a more relatable analogy is like a landlord collecting rent. That landlord has predictable revenue. We're all going to pay rent and everyone's going to pay the same amount every single month. All of a sudden, all the stress and anxiety of how much cash you're going to get in starts to alleviate. Less stress and less anxiety means you can work on another problem. I think that that is more of a modern, I don't know what the, the right, you know, current way of thinking about this is as well. I mean, I remember being a young architect and hearing the horror stories of clients being 90 days past due, 180 days past due. Has that landscape shifted, do you feel like, as well because of all of this yes. other stuff that's been influencing architecture over the last decade plus? The trend we see here at Monograph is more and more firms are moving into some version of a monthly billing cycle. It makes a lot of business sense. If you're not collecting any revenue that month, but you still have to run payroll, it's the math. The math doesn't work. That's monthly. Yeah. Right? Like, it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You're never going to say, employees, please wait. I'm, I'm not going to run your payroll because we haven't collected any payment yet. Like, you're never going to say that. I'm sure that has happened, but <laughs> I, I, I really hope not. I hope not. That'll be a really bad experience. Right. But I think when thinking about business, it doesn't have to be scary. It just has to be logical and practical. Payroll happens every two weeks or once a month, depending. Like, those are the two most common pay cycles. And architects is a business. So, like, we just want to make sure that there's enough cash coming in because you're going to have to spend that cash to deliver payroll. And the goal is after you process payroll, there's still money left. Right. Like you just keep business really, really simple. If you have 100K coming in, and you need to spend 100K, well, you're not keeping anything. If you have 100K coming in and you have to spend 150K, it's like, oh my God, you just lost 50. Well, talk about what we haven't talked about in the report yet. And I think also this starting to segue into the idea of the resource that you are creating beyond just the platform that you've created, right? I know, at least I've seen in the past, you guys have done Section Cut Conference. You have the resource on the web where you're cataloging these conversations around practice operations. I know that was like the main theme. I guess we're kind of pulling pieces out of the conversation here to start to connect these dots and tie it all together. But architecture students, graduates go into business without the business acumen, and you're trying to help them run profitable businesses, successful architecture businesses. And so let's start to get into that side of things where you shoulder this burden, but you don't look at it as a burden. You look at it as an opportunity to get this stuff out into our industry to raise the whole industry up. Talk about the work that you've done in the report, but also beyond that to help make that happen for people so that architects aren't trying to figure this out alone in all of these different silos. Evan, architects are not alone. They're not alone I think every firm owner is struggling in some capacity. And here at Monograph, we're extraordinarily motivated to continue to be in service. And that means we will be in service with information that we gather in trends, like this report. It means we're going to continue to be in service in hosting debates and conferences and being in person. But it absolutely means that we're going to continue to build an incredible software company to pave that path and to make that much more streamlined and easier. The goal is to help, as you said, to make firms profitable. And we're going to continue to build for a very long time everything we need to help a firm achieve that the easiest and most streamlined way possible. So things that are coming, we're in private beta. We just launched a payroll product. Monograph will start to process payroll for architects. A big reason for this is to help you be profitable. We need more insights into like what are your biggest costs are occurring and your biggest cost is mm -hmm. payroll. So mm -hmm. if we can map your biggest expense against your time and project execution over time, while also helping you collect invoices and payments more streamlined, we can absolutely point at opportunities where every firm can get to profitability easier. We can identify where there are inefficiencies and we can propose opportunities on where where is the highest leverage and the easiest things to do. Disruptive technology. <laughs> it's like sounds like the most not the most, but this is an unsexy topic in the business of architecture. And that's why I love talking mm. about this because of how important it is to not avoid it or to not be like, we need to put our attention here. Talk about incumbents in the space that you're playing in and the lack of innovation, the lack of We've talked about this in the past, I think, in our last conversation, like building a tool that people like to yeah. use and want to use and put good data in versus one that they hate using, right? You guys are up against a big one in that category. And that is not even the main tool that architects are using on a day-to-day -day basis, which kind of has the similar traits, right? So you're doing amazing work in that space. Is there anything that you have to say about that? 
The work is not easy. The work is incredibly hard, but that's what makes it really exciting. I am thrilled to be working on not sexy things because not sexy things mm -hmm. are the things that hold up the sexy things. Yes, <laughs> totally. This is no different if you think of it as an architectural project. Like right. well, pouring a foundation isn't really sexy. It holds everything up. Yep. It allows all the work to be built on top. Your structural systems, your HVAC systems, they're not sexy. Uh, there was an amazing course at Michigan called Building Anatomy, and I loved it. I absolutely loved mm. it because it's the guts right the foundation it enables all the sexy work to occur if that is not stable mm -hmm. there is no opportunity for sexy work so i'm incredibly excited yes we we face a legacy competitor and yes there's incumbents and yes i don't care because I, I know our product is going to be extraordinarily better because our on first principles we prioritize the architects well yeah because you are one right that's true i'm not interested <laughs> in building software that doesn't prioritize architects in a very selfish way this whole idea of us the royal us solving this yeah. for ourselves to me is much better than having somebody else do it for us i'm not interested in building a tool just for accountants what's fascinating mm -hmm. to me is a representational project of how do I take financial information that accountants know how to read, but really design a product where architects can understand quickly. One of my all-time favorites as like a design project, and it's really simple. It's the gas gauge in a car. It's mm. so simple. It just tells you how much mm -hmm. gas you have left. But guess what? Everyone knows this. <laughs> I know if I should speed up or not speed up. I know if I need to go to the gas mm -hmm. station or not. I know if I can make this last errand before coming home. There's so much information baked into such a simple measurement mm. that as human beings, we inherently know. Building more of those tools are similar ways of representing financial information. So architects and firm owners know exactly what to do next. It's a lifelong goal. Mm -hmm. It's a mission. It's a purpose. How much fuel is in the tank? Right? It's so simple. <laughs> And then you can imagine when you it get is. to business and everyone overcomplicates things. There's all these different KPIs to watch. Right. Let's answer a really simple question. How much fuel is left for the business? How much fuel is left for the project? How much fuel is left for a phase? Just keep it really simple. Everyone else is smart enough to know what happens next. I feel like our conversations, Robert, it's kind of like a conversation, but it's also kind of like a sermon. <laughs> there are certain people who I talk to who are sages and you are one of those people and i really enjoy our conversations because you deliver so much wisdom I'm really happy that we're able to have this conversation today because and record it because this is the kind of thing that even if it's not for the casual listener of this show i hope that it is something that is shareable with somebody beyond that and that to me is what we can bring to this profession together and i'm so happy in the work that you're doing and that you're doing it so thank you so much for doing that with me today thank you for having me i'm honored i don't think i have that much wisdom yet i still feel very young that's a sign of, of wisdom right there <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I mean, yeah, the older I get, the less I feel like I know and the more questions that I ask. And I'm glad to have people like you around that I can ask those questions to. That's the most important quality. You and I, let's just keep asking the questions because the more we ask it, the more someone will work on it. Yeah. Well, where can people get this report? I will put a link to whatever I need to in the show notes for people to do that. But go ahead and, and let people know. Uh, put the link in there because I'm, I'm not going to be able to yep. recall the entire link. So I'm excited. If you are looking for a way to contact me, it's really easy. It's just Robert at Monograph. And if you email me, I'll also send you the report. Not a problem. Okay, cool. So definitely monograph.com. I'll put a link to the report in the show notes and everywhere you can follow Robert and Monograph online. And if this is the first time you're hearing about Robert and Monograph, this won't be the last time. So I'll put a link to our previous conversation in the show notes and I look forward to the next conversation. Robert, thanks so much. I can't wait. I'll see you in person soon.